Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report, and we have Tim Alexander, and you've got to compress a lot of uh, scary news, and they get right with God message pretty quickly there, Tim. Uh, there's a lot of uh, issues to cover. We have, of course, the um, latest announcement by Mitt Romney that we should accept the uh, herding instinct and follow um, Paul Ryan into the uh, the fold of austerity fascism. At the same time, we have the Israeli war looming and war on Iran looming. We have the meltdown of Europe. Uh, we have Fukushima not solved at all by any means. We have all kinds of things cooking on the back burner, so for, as they say, but soon to be on the front burner uh, very soon. And these might make uh, the fall very unpleasant. I know that well, uh, like uh, the closing of the Mississippi River because it doesn't have enough water in it to for uh, transport. That will uh, it will be an economic uh, impact, uh, a devastating economic impact. One of the things that made Amer- has made America great is not only the fact that we have a big land mass that can produce a great deal of food, but we have a river transportation system. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was thinking about opening several ethanol. Um, plants, and I was working with a couple of top people in the the business, because in this area there are quite a few ethanol plants, and uh, uh, one of the things I learned that uh, when you compare cost of shipping a product, a uh, particularly large product like you know millions of gallons of ethanol, uh, the cost is like eight times cheaper to go by rail than by truck and six times cheaper than rail to go by river barge. So it, the, the, the cost of shipping large uh, volumes of material, uh, be it coal for, for uh, a power generation or whatever, is dramatically less using a river system. And the Ohio Mississippi Waterway is the world's largest continuous navigable uh, waterway on earth. And uh, if uh, now the Ohio is still functioning, but the Mississippi is so low because of the drought that uh, it's very close to the, the point where they're going to have to shut it down. They won't be able to ship uh, the barges on it, and that is a very bad thing. Well, now we have, uh, we have that on top of lots of other. The drought is causing oh, yeah. a, a food crop crisis. And well, it's, it's not our- just in the United States. It's, it, it's in India. It's in Russia. Russia has lost, again, a lot of its grain. Uh, uh, parts of uh, southern uh, Europe. Uh, the uh, Now, it's winter down there now, but uh, in South America, a lot of the crops weren't that good this, uh, this last season for them. So we're looking at, uh, in the few months ahead, we're looking at a real disaster because I mean, we're looking at the people at the very bottom end in many third world countries literally won't have enough food. And the cost will be so high. And, and um, let me tell you, if you're going to starve and your family's going to starve, your kids are going to starve, uh, you're far more prone to grab a stick or a gun or what other and uh, make war a revolution. Uh, because you're going to die anyway, and your babies are going to die anyway. So it uh, it raises the stakes uh, all over in, in ways that we can't even anticipate what's going to happen yet. And then you've got uh, this this evil, insane so-and-so, uh, Netanyahu and his government. Uh, a story was leaked uh, yesterday, and I carried it on my blog, Europe, uh, and then the Iranian uh, blog, Press TV, has his has carried uh, an article on it. It came from the Israeli news website, uh, Ynet, and Richard Silverstein uh, uh, had a war document leaked to him by a very high-level Israeli source. Uh, and it, it gives uh, an, out, uh, an outline of missile and aerial strikes, assassination of Iranian missiles, and massive cyber attack that uh, is designed to paralyze Iran's electronic networks. And let me let me read just a little tiny bit of it here. Uh, smart carbon fiber weapons will also attack Iran's power plants, causing circuits which will stop their operations. Uh, more missiles will target uh, the nuclear reactor and other nuclear facilities across Iran. Uh, and of course, a large number of uh, senior officials have been targeted for assassination by Israeli missiles. Uh, and I'm sure operatives in the country. Uh, now. Well, 
what all this man and they supposedly the following the first wave of attacks uh, an Israeli radar satellite will pass over Iran and transfer information directly to warplanes making their way covertly towards Iran uh, and they'll have electronic gear previously unknown to the wider public not even to uh, the United States etc etc and the targets are the sub 3 and the various ballistic missile silos storage tanks for chemical potents of rocket fuel industrial facilities for producing missile control systems, centrifuge production plants, and more. What all this does, okay, is this puts the Iranians and the Syrians and Hezbollah on a hair trigger. And uh, you just, you don't want to put your enemy on a hair trigger. And it, 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 it reinforces something which I have, have noted for some time, and that is that all the uh, various powers in the Middle East know that if, war, if a general Middle Eastern war breaks out, the knives come out. This is, not, this is not a second Lebanon war. This is not a war that will slowly evolve, and, and this will be done, and then this uh, it will be a countermeasure, and so forth and so forth. All hell's going to break out very quickly. Yeah, in and other words, this will be a... Yeah, it'll be a firestorm is what you're saying. It'll be like an open gas. Like, if you ever seen a tanker on a highway that turns over and it kind of gets a rupture, and then the fuel is all over the highway, Boom. and it's a, it, anything, somebody decides to have a smoke and just throw their butt, the explosion will throw you back 100 yards. I mean, it's going to be yeah. that kind of thing. It's just going to really take off like a rocket. Well, it, it essentially uh, what the technology, and particularly as outlined in this document that uh, really hit the the, the uh, internet yesterday uh, by Silverstein, what this what it means is that uh, it's use it or lose it time. Uh, the the various uh, trump cards that Iran and Syria and Hezbollah have with their missiles, with their chemical warheads, their radiological warheads, their fuel air explosive warheads, they've got to use them, and they've got to use them right away or literally use the capability of delivering them on target. And that means that there's no, uh, if this, if it begins, there's no, there's no middle ground. This is an all out to the death uh, battle. Uh, between uh, a number of very well-armed nations in the Middle East with major powers on both sides. Uh, and uh, the, the likelihood of that becoming the Third World War becomes very, very high. Yeah, which and means is that it's sanity. Well, which means, by the way, because this looks so so certain, it's also a virtual guarantee that if we know the biblical uh, timeline, we know that there, whatever level of destruction, it may be a lot more than we ever wanted, it's not the end. It means it has to be the thing that's going to lead up to a peace treaty that's going to take these disparate sides that want to destroy each other and uh, neutralize them, at least temporarily. That temporarily means it says that they shall sign well, a covenant for 1-7. I, 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 as you know, I don't agree with that analysis. But uh, It's in the Bible, though. That the thing is, neither well, of us wants yeah, to. But yeah. it's my analysis of what's in the Bible that I, uh, I'm disagreeing yeah. with that. But in any case... Uh, well, well, let's put it this way, Tim. Let, 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 me know, let me finish here. What happens is, in the Bible, it says there has to be a time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, that has to start when the Jews start the blood sacrifice. We're not there yet. It has to start when they partition the state and set up a sacrifice on the Temple Mount. Where we are right now is we know that they're about to defang Syria. They know that Syria has to be removed before they attack Iran. Uh, I don't see them defanging Syria very quickly. And I think that the Iranian attack is probably not going to happen before the, the, uh, the election. My guess is that the promises behind the scenes of both Romney and um, Romney and uh, Obama is that they have a green light to attack but that means logistic support from America for bomber tankers they can't control the ground so we don't have the armed forces to do so or the budget so it means whatever we do even if we kind of bomb the hell out of their missile silos and their so called bases uh, we don't guarantee any long term stability there it's just going to be a lead into a peace treaty of some kind that will be very shaky with Russia and China ready to stomp on our neck. So. And we're back. And, um, yeah, so let's get into the uh, into some of the other signs. Well, These are very a good one. Uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security has bought 1.2 billion rounds of ammunition. 
Okay. Are those the ones you talked about uh, that went through the uh, National Endowment for Democracy? Initially, they tried to say it was going for the National Weather Service. In fact, a lot of these billets, I'm sure, are going over to the so-called Syrian Free Army graduates of Camp X-Ray and uh, has and, and the uh, you know these various well, extremist maybe they are, Muslims. Maybe they aren't. I mean, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I've, I've certainly I'm I have said privately that I suspect that some of this is. Uh, 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 you know, so, black flag. Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> a lot of it's but, stockpiling. But, but they, then again, they know that they're being tracked by the uh, alternative media, and they're still doing it because their their purchase uh, methodology is in place. They have to open bids and so forth. Uh, I think we are preparing increasingly for uh, violence. Uh, it looks I think like you're right. Uh, well, just it does give a scenario, uh, a possibility, not prophetic. Let's say March 13th, 2013, we have a uh, an asteroid that strikes uh, off the Pacific, the Pacific Island, North Island of Kauai, Hawaii, or we have a CME around that date. It could be anything. It could be a power outage from we decided to attack Iran and they decided to put up a, a you know like a, a small. Uh, you know, container ship 200 miles off the Pacific and Atlantic coast and blow up at 75,000 feet. A, uh, or we just have a, a massive weapon. stock market crash that follows yeah, the, the, the collapse of the euro. Right. So in other words, there's a half a dozen what I call menu from hell things that are pretty damn likely to happen in the next year. I mean, we're not talking about unlikely. If you, you're you've odds, got, right now, you've got a, a, it's just slightly over 100 million Americans um, on the dole who are receiving food stamps or some sort of payments from the government uh, you have an enormous number of people who are unemployed and underemployed most of these kids that are graduating from universities now with bachelor, masters, what other degrees they can't get jobs or if they get jobs they're about seven twenty-five an hour or eight dollars an hour and they're part time jobs well when you've got a twenty or thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollar uh, a loan that's due which you can't declare bankruptcy to get out from under and you're making uh, three hundred dollars a week and uh, you know you, you want to move out of uh, mom and dad's house and you got a girlfriend or a boyfriend you want to get married and, and you got to have a car and you got to have this and you got to have that that three hundred dollars doesn't go very far and uh, and, you, and you may not have three hundred you may not have anything and uh, uh, what you we saw a couple of days ago in France, in northern France, was just really massive riots oh, by yeah. young people, and and they were very violent. I mean, the, the kid, the, the the rioters were carrying guns, and uh, there were a lot of cops injured, and it was kind of a wake up call for France. Well, you know, when you have such a large percentage of your young people that can't get jobs. I mean, uh, it's bad enough if you're old, uh, if you're in your 50s or your 60s or, or, or so forth. But when you're 20-something and you're just starting life and you're, you're, you're full of hope, and there's no there's no employment, and it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what what education you've got. Uh, maybe you can get a job at Sears part time. Maybe you can be a door greeter at Wally World. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean that that that's uh, uh, talk about a slap in the face to somebody that spent years. But but, but it's easy. To, but the problem is those problems could be easily solved. I'm writing a period series of white papers and post up on up on on clay and iron. These are the solutions. And we have, for example, I've talked many times to Webster Griffin Tarpley. A lot of my thoughts and plans, it turns out, were very virtually parallel. For example, number one, you give 0% loans to students going to university so they can pay it back over 40 or 50 years. You have a moratorium on foreclosures. You allow businesses with capital investments in factories <coughs> here in America to have a major tax break. So if it's small or medium business and they want to set up factories in America, give them 0% loans. You want to get things going, start building infrastructure, give bond issues. Uh, where the federal government backs the bond issue. And, and, yeah. and dramatically okay. reduce the regulatory burden on small and medium-sized businesses. Right. And believe me, I mean, I've seen it up close. I know people, and, and it, it's at the point where many people in business in America, the, the cost, the insane governmental hidden cost, they just can't handle it anymore. Uh, right. Like the guy that uh, owns a, 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 a bread company, and they want to assess him $800,000 uh, to put scrubbers on his 
rent on them. Well, well uh, let's look at health care. What? Let, let's, say you're, let's say you're an internist and you work in an office with four other internists or you're a surgeon. And now all of a sudden you got Obamacare, which is squeezing the hell out of Medicare. And we got Paul Ryan, who's real smir- smirking with his big eyes that he did such big cuts, and they're going to do bigger cuts to Medicare. What's going to happen to Paul seniors? Paul Ryan is a, is, a, is a nasty disaster. He's a nasty disaster. In fact, I'll tell you, let's put it this way. This is being honest and, and fair and balanced, like Fox News, which isn't. The fact is, the fact is, here we have Obama, who is a plague from hell, who's not an American citizen. But guess what? It's the race to the bottom. Mitt Romney and now Paul Ryan are actually racing to the bottom faster, and they're making Obama look good as much as he is a plague from hell. And well, now we've know, got there's, the situation. There's scuttle today about whether, at the last minute, uh, Obama is going to replace uh, his vice president with Hillary. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. But again, Hillary Clinton is singularly the most evil person I've ever met on the planet while living. Well, uh, I, she is intelligent. Uh, I, I, she is malevolently evil. More, more evil than our former vice president, but uh, oh yes, she she's is right up there. She's also I, I, she's I also. And I looked her in the eye. She's uh, uh, she's a disaster. Right, you, know? you got to understand with Hillary. She's very intelligent. She's not stupid. She's very intelligent. She's so is Dick Cheney. He, she, uh, he was uh, yeah, I, right I up there. Someone Dick. that uh, was a congressman, uh, right, right? When he was a congressman, Dick Cheney, very, very, very intelligent. Well, and he's both, both the guy people, is brilliant. The guy's brilliant, he's but brilliant guess what? Hell. But guess what? He's evil, evil. I mean, liquid. What I call right from the ninth ring of Hades, from the bowels of the of the digestive uses of Hades itself. That's how dangerous, okay? Yeah, okay. Now, then then we're looking at these different issues. The solutions are real simple. We sent over an expeditionary force to fix uh, with our military Fukushima. We get proper containment there. We decide that we're going to... uh, don't abolish the Fed. Take the damn thing over. Don't just audit it. And I, do, I, I agree with Ron Paul. We need to audit it, but we need to actually take it over. We need to also put up regulations you like need Glass to put Steagall. A stake, a, a stake through the heart of the Federal Reserve. It was always unconstitutional. It was always <clears throat> well, nothing take, but a rip off by mostly foreign. Yeah, bankers. but what you do, but what you do is you take it over. And the reason why you take it over is because you need to have regulation of the banks. You need to have a firewall between speculative the, banking. The, the the bill that enacted that allows for a very very small amount of money. It's a little over a billion dollars. The federal government to to take over the Federal Reserve. It would be very easy yeah. is there, but right. Bill, we can do all this stuff. We have to have the will, and that's where we lack it because in the people controlling things, their hearts are full of evil. Exactly. Core. That's where we get the second and part of your message because no I know you have to go. In these people, it's it's right. it's, it's, uh, it's Satan, and right. this is what's driving. Even that monster Hitler, even he managed to take Germany and turn it around in two years' time to make it a prosperous country from hyperinflation. Even he managed. To do that now we can, are not we don't have hyperinflation at least not yet we could turn this country around six months you have to have the six will months. to do it instead the will is there to destroy america they are deliberately destroying our country absolutely as you say get right with god and then our politics will get right but we're not going in the right direction both parties are heading to the bottom and it looks like romney and ryan are Welcome back to the uh, Nutramedical Report, and we uh, missed you last week, Chris, but now you've got lots of time with uh, Tim having to go off to university. Give us an update of what's going on in terms of what's happening. Uh, things are by no means controlled in Japan. The situation has uh, got some very interesting twists and turns in terms of reports that you have to use some wisdom and some experience that you have to even discern what they're actually saying because they do it in, in an obfuscating way, so it's difficult to understand exactly what they're trying to imply. For example, as you mentioned before the show, water in a control room that has which sw- electrical switching gears. Let's get into some of the details of what's happening at TEPCO and uh, are these fools getting control like the Keystone cops of anything? Uh, they're not getting in control of anything. They're, they've started with a plan uh, many, many months ago and really they're not enhancing the plan or they're changing the plan even if the plan isn't working so you know a lot of times when you have a plan you're supposed to you're supposed to assess how it's working and if it's not working well then you have to readjust now this was still a major ordeal as to handle the waste that's coming out of out of uh, well, we'll say all the all the units at fukushima 
what is going on is that is the unit three was utilizing some of the unit unit four's uh, systems that may be somewhat intact. So they were hosing, they, they used hoses, and they were bringing over the highly contaminated waste over from Unit 3 to process in Unit 4. Well, we, we talk, I don't, I, I mean, I'm almost sick of saying it, flimsy makeshift systems don't work for very long. Well, now they're getting water. That was the big news. They had uh, a lot of water spilled out of pipes that were actually you know, hoses that uh, somebody stumbled upon, they saw it. They don't go there every day, and they realize that instead of the water being transferred to, let's say, the miscellaneous waste system where it's supposed to go, now it's being transferred to the floor. And what the articles don't tell you is where this water is actually ending up. It's ending up in a uh, an electrical switch gear room where you really don't want to have water around if you want to maintain electrical power, whatever electrical power they have. You have to, you know, so you certainly don't want to have a, a lot of water in that room. Now, it's not very deep and everything else, but it's very, very radioactive. Now, people say, well, then it's okay. Then it's not that deep and all. I said, well, then what if you've got to go ahead and emergency get to a power supply in that room, and now you can't get there because you've made it inaccessible radiologically? You know, and, and now you, you took an easy 10-minute job, and you easily made a six-hour job out of it or longer. So... This is still an ongoing problem. It hampers your recovery efforts, and it hampers um, all kinds of uh, you know future activities that you can have because now the uh, you've introduced areas that you just are now now inaccessible until you clean them up, and that takes a long time. And uh, so that's really what the big news uh, coming out of Fukushima now. Just keep looking for big problems with uh, handling the waste. The liquid waste, the solid waste, what do you do with it? Oh, by the way, they were going, to, part of this uh, waste system was to first process it a bit as much as you can. It was very radioactive, and the rest of it was to bring it to the incinerator. So, you know, we already, and we already talked about incinerating uh, waste, and really that that's not 100% the right thing to do, but that's what they're doing. Um, and uh, so that, that really is where, what's going on there right now. They're not, they're, they're, they haven't moved any more fuel out of Unit 4 yet. I know they had an earthquake um, near there. What was that? A 7.7, se- a a 7. wasn't it, uh, last week or so? Yeah, they did have another big earthquake, yeah. And so what it means is basically the plant is getting further degradation from neutron annealing. Uh, it's, uh, there's subsidence because we have all the superheated steam. Portions of the plant are actually subsiding into the ground. Uh, we have uh, further contamination not only of groundwater but steam jets that go out into the ocean and out for kilometers away from the plant. Uh, the, 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 they've, they put a cap over cooling pool four. What's going on with the other plants? Let's go down through like plant one, two, three, cooling pool four. What's happening at each facility and what actions are they taking that seems positive or maybe uh, even remotely going to contain the situation? All right, unit, well, unit one, unit two, unit three, they're still adding inventory. They haven't really even assessed any core damage yet, you know, in any, in any of the units at that point. And they, and they really can't until you can get in there. So really the philosophy is to feed and bleed. And that is, I say it's a technical term, but really... Uh, it's take, taking the temperatures. We already know that a lot of the temperature instrumentation is you know, somewhat flawed. Uh, some of them track, some of them don't. And uh, really all they can do is keep on injecting. And there was, of course, the, the, the big dilemma now is that was seawater. Now, one of the uh, latest, uh, and then we're going way back back into, uh, back into March, they they delayed pumping seawater in because see, that is that is your last ditch effort. Every boiling water reactor of that type has the capability of of injecting seawater, and that's one of the. And it's not it's a system that you'd never want to use, but in such an emergency, you you jump on it, and you do it. Well, in this case, they delayed that, and really they exacerbated the condition even more because there probably was some discussion about hey, maybe, maybe we can save this plant, you know, and that. That came up, but uh, what they did was they delayed. They delayed a lot of things. They didn't follow any of their procedures. They didn't follow the, the approved procedures. And also, recently, we found out that they only had about uh, nine emergency drills uh, up until uh, like almost, almost in the entire life of that plant itself. I mean, really full full scale emergency drills. So, uh, which I did send you that article, by the way, and. Uh, 
in other words, they were ill, Ill prepared for it. And the procedures that they did have, they neglected to follow. They made a command decision and and uh, and uh, to uh, you know to violate the procedures. They should have gotten into uh, injecting seawater way before then. But the whole thing is, you know, once you do that, then you know that you can't ever use that plant again. I think they were trying to. Well, they were they, they were in denial, and uh, and I have a feeling that that would be. That we would be in denial too, you know. It, I mean, it's really to think about it. If you're going to, you got to be the one to make the decision to go ahead and, um, well, render your plant uh, unavailable for the for the remainder of its time. You know, it's that's a big decision to make, which which leads into some other discussion we have too today. But um, they did delay it, and on in that in that respect, they uh, caused more damage to the core than they they, they should have allowed that point yeah um, in other words it's all very really bad news in other words yeah that's bad news it was bad news that they delayed the vent <clears throat> also mm-hmm. and you know oh boy this, this is good to go on into the uh, last no, the, discussion. The, the, big, the big question we I'd have after listening to this so far is shouldn't there be an international force of nuclear experts and military to go into Fukushima and try to get containment and really get control of this? They need some kind of tent sarcophagus, not a concrete one. They need a water filtration, air filtration system. They need seawalls. They need a way of pumping it out and converting it to solid radioactive waste and transporting it to a safe depot. None of these things are done. And and how soon or how likely is it they're going to lose control of cooling pool four? Because they started trying to remove some of the fuel, the one third of the fuel rod assemblies that were younger, more likely to be unstable. Are they removing those? Because I know they were bringing in and uh, trying to attach a crane-like device to remove those. Is that starting to happen? What what's going on? They took the easiest one, the easiest two assemblies, the biggest two assemblies that they can get, and now they're deciding really how to proceed with the. That that was the test to see whether it's feasible to do. Well, it was feasible for those, but now there's a lot of planning to be done, and I I believe that they're in the planning stage for a full scale cleanup of Unit Four. Unit Four is still on everybody's mind. Uh, it, it's even on the uh, it, it, it's a separate entry on the NRC's website. If you look at that and click over to Japan, it has its own heading. So Unit Four still is a big deal and Unit 4 will have to be dealt with. It has to be done exactly right or it will make you feel you'll, you'll get you'll get the release. You'll get the release if, if you don't do it right and if you don't do it, you'll still get the release. So it's one of those situations that it, it's got to be very, very, uh, done with very uh, much care and precision. Yeah. Um, uh, how likely is it in the next, say, a couple of months that we'll have a major burp? I call it burp because it may, won't be the last one, but a major burp of radiation. Uh, I think we're already having minor burps because I see my radiation detector sometimes shoot up to three plus times uh, background. And I know San Onofre is down, which is, by by the way, with the taxpayers and the rules here, about what they call it Lemon Law in California, it's extremely unlikely they're going to be able to restart those plants for financial reasons because they're trying their very best to see if they can make the taxpayer pay for it. When we come back, we'll talk about that as well with Chris Harris. Uh, summarize what uh, we've done so far. Jim Scarola, co-chairman of the industry's Fukushima Response Steering Committee, told the commi- commission in his presentation the response to the accident is well underway with emergency equipment having been inspected and tested. Uh, basically, they're just whitewashing it. They're still not fixing it. Here in North America, what's going on with San Onofre, the average ratepayer is now being charged, uh, and it's costing $54 million a month for the plant to be down. They tried to just say they're going to restart at least one of the turbines in November, but the fact is, it's unlikely that the uh, the California Public Utilities Commission are going to allow the taxpayer to be on the hook for, they have a lemon law here. I think San Onofre is toast. And I think uh, they had to reactivate plants in, in Huntington Beach and Carlsbad to make up the difference in Southern California. They had a power warning uh, just a week ago in Los Angeles County and Orange County, which uh, get 80% of the power from San Onofre. Only 20% goes towards San Diego County. Um, we're not ready for uh, super hot summers. We're not ready for major degradation of nuclear plants. We're not ready even for plants to get so hot that the plant can't operate properly. Tell us about that, uh, uh, yeah. because, Chris, this well, is really interesting that literally it's so hot that we don't have normal circumstances even around the plant to tolerate these temperature differences. 
Yeah, well, you know, this is uh, summer, and and it could be due to any any number of climate change we're talking about. And I'm not saying global warming. I'm saying you know the the Gulf Stream or whatever it is bottling up the heat, whatever it is. But the Midwest has been hammered by some high temperatures this summer, and what it's been doing is is been making some of the water temperatures around. I'm talking about up in, in uh, Minnesota, like um, uh, well, the Point Beach and the uh, uh, that's Wisconsin. That that plant up there had to actually. Uh, for for a period of time, reduce power, reduce load, lose capacity because it was outside of its normal operating temperatures for seawater. Seawater is very important at these plants. I had that at UC where we call it the ultimate heat sink. That's the last ditch place where you reject heat from an accident, from normal operation, from any 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 size any size in between normal operation and an accident, and you have to always be able to reject the heat of the core there. If, it, if, that's, if the rejection of heat stops, you melt. So, yeah, you know, what you're saying, what you're basically it, saying, summarizing is, if you can't reject the heat because it's too hot outside, your core of your, of your nuclear reactor thing can melt, and you can actually get a corium melt through the containment. Yeah, and that, that is a safety design basis upon which you say, fine, my seawater will never exceed 75 degrees, it's never had before, and if it ever does, I've got to shut the plant down. Well, this happened just uh, two days ago at the Millstone Nuclear Power Plant uh, Unit 2 in Connecticut, Niantic, Connecticut. So these guys exceeded 75-degree intake temperature, and uh, they had to act, and then the plant still shut down now. It, it takes suction off of a little harbor there, a very nice rustic little harbor, uh, Niantic. Uh, beautiful area and everything out there. It's near Broaden, Connecticut. But right. The temperature of the water got it got higher than the actual limits, and the operators did what they're supposed to do. They followed the rules, and they said, "Okay, you got to shut the plant down." In a hot at a hot time of the year, that means that you can't use the electricity. You can't you can't produce electricity there. It almost is like um, it's almost counter its purpose. If you, if you get what I mean, it's almost like, wait a minute, we need we need the electricity during hot temperatures, and yet when when we exceed these temperatures, you can't produce any power out of the plant. So. You know, it, yeah, that, that's it, really it a very to... dangerous situation. The other side of yeah. this is we're going to have Maria Consolo uh, back, Christina Consolo back, uh, coming up tomorrow, uh, dealing with some of the mutations. We're seeing mutant butterflies, mutant plants, not just around Japan, but all over the northern hemisphere now. Uh, they're trying to say it's one of the reports that hit butterflies but didn't hit humans. Uh, not, not. The fact is that we're having the unborn having spontaneous miscarriages and trisomies. We're having elderly being knocked off because of oxidative stress. And we're having people lose the ability of their normal stem cells to protect themselves and to heal their tissues. So we're going to see a lot of different illnesses showing up and accelerating every illness you can imagine caused by Fukushima. And the danger, too, of these idiots if they decide to strike the Bashir reactor with a nuclear attack against the Bashir reactor in Iran, uh, we'll have a massive cloud of radiation from there as well. <clears throat> the people try to downplay and say it's not a problem. Here in North America, we're not prepared for extreme weather, uh, earthquakes in the London Madrid Fault, Diablo Canyon on the fault, three converging fault lines on an Indian burial ground, San Onofre sitting right off the San Jacinta upthrust fault zone. To me, all nuclear plants sitting near fault lines uh, should be shut down. We should, if we're having nuclear, we need to have safe nuclear that will shut down. If it gets a station blackout, it automatically just shuts itself off like thorium and pebble bed. We have to find a way of containing reactors so that none of them release tritium. All nuclear plants are releasing tritium. And they, they don't, they don't, and the fact is they don't have the safety features. If you're going to have nuclear, and the reason why I tell people that nuclear is in our future, uh, it may not be, it may be nuclear fusion tokamak reactors or, or some more advanced like pebble bed or thorium. The reason is a thing called peak oxygen. The Earth only has a specific capacity of ability, even if you stretch it and put higher CO2 in the atmosphere, to convert back into carbon-oxygen cycle. The problem is a carbon-oxygen cycle. It's not whether we're going to run out of fuel. There's, there's enough hydrocarbon fuel to run the world for millions of years. That's not the issue. Although when you pump it out and you put something of different specific gravity, you get earthquakes and subduction uh, fault slips like occurred in the uh, Aceh area that caused the Indonesian uh, super tsunami that killed a quarter million people. That's because you put water at a different specific gravity than the oil that's pumped in there. So what's going on with Fukushima is most women in, in northern Japan are either trying to use birth control means or they're aborting or trying not to get pregnant. Here in North America, as the bioaccumulation increases, 
we're going to see more and more diseases, more genetic mutations, and it's not just animals with short lifespans like butterflies and other insects and uh, short half-life things like squirrels. We're going to start seeing human beings accumulating lots of really bad things happening. This yeah. is not going what? away. It's bioaccumulation, it's called. And, and really what we need to do is to really beef up the emergency equipment that we have available. Some of those recommendations out of the task force were very much very similar to the recommendations that um, you know, my colleagues like Joe and, and uh, Clark and a few other guys we came up with, you know, for looking at uh, widespread damage at these plants. They really need to go. One of the most important things that we talked about is you need extra additional people equally trained on to use them, and that's the most expensive part. If you could get, you can get fire engines, you can get everything, but you need to get the people, and you've got to keep them so that they can be available very soon, and yet not be in the damage path. And nobody knows how to really deal with that. You know, what, I mean, really, let's go. Let's go and say, what, what if, what if half of the operations force gets incapacitated because of what? what you're trying to combat, you've got to have another half of the crew that's equally trained and available. Well, that, that means doubling the size of your, uh, of your workforce, really, at, at the plants and keeping them, you know, keeping them on top of things. That's a very difficult task, and that's really what's, what they're fighting right now. And, yeah. uh, and my, my, I'm going to say, if you go to NUCPROS, uh, N-U-C-P-R-O-S dot com, you'll see licensed operators, I mean, my, my brothers in the, in the field, and sisters in the field, they're over there, they're saying the same thing. I mean, I'm not out uh, alone on this. They're saying, no, but who's going to who's gonna be responsible for implementing these new, the, the new, you can't just keep piling it on the same people you have. You've got to get more people to do it, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the thing so, is, they can't keep on whitewashing it and saying we're making significant progress and so we're going to expand nuclear plants. After the little hiccup, China is actually moving forward with a lot of nuclear reactors. I heard they're going to launch, I think sometime this year, early next year, 38 more reactors. And yes, they're a little bit more advanced design, but they're not advanced enough to deal with the fact that China is sitting on a lot of fault zones. That's why in the western province of China, a few years ago, we had a major earthquake that killed a quarter million people almost. Um, this is not wise to do this. I mean, I don't think reactors should ever be near the fault lines. They should be in areas where it's safe. Maybe some smaller reactors. They can make reactors now big enough to be the size of a refrigerator. You can literally bury it in the ground for 20 years, run power off it, and when it runs out in 20 years, you just dig it up. You don't need to have giant reactors serving huge areas over power lines where you get a lot of drop in power. You can have these the size of a refrigerator, and there's no radiation release at all. There's no trade whatever. These are different kinds of reactors. Well, you know, and everything was everything was meant to feed the big grid, the centralized you know, power system. We're already seeing that. that in central central power system is, is is a dinosaur, and the problem right. is that the Congress passed a bill, and and Senator Lisa Murkowski, uh, for because she wanted a green bill in Alaska, killed the uh, the hardening of the power grid. We also have not passed laws to say if you're going to build nuclear power plants, and it should be a collaboration between the state and the corporations, they have to be safe, not releasing tritium. Not going, to, not going to store on site all the nuclear materials. You need to have rail systems, not trucks, to remove the radioactive material in solid waste form. So if you, have, you don't have a spill, like we almost had a spill uh, on I-70 when I was one of the doctors working in 1997 with Reserve Admiral Hughes at Rocky Mountain Ahmed, and we had a contract with Rocky Flats taking care of nuclear materials moving off site. Uh, how can I say, as they say, as Einstein says, you know, genius is quantifiable, stupidity is limitless. We sure are seeing a boatload of stupidity. That's absolutely true. It's amazing. So those little butterflies being mutated, if you go and look at the news there, Fukushima action causes butterfly mutations from Pravda. Yeah, the butterfly and the, effect. Yeah, the, it's not just a butterfly effect. It's affecting all of us down the road. Amazing. Thank you, Chris. Amazing update. <laughs> 